Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Russell Moore to the stage as our featured speaker this evening. Uh, Russell serves as the eighth president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission uh, for the Southern Baptist Convention. It's the moral and public policy agency of what's the nation's largest Protestant denomination. Uh, Dr. Moore is, is an ethicist and theologian by background, but also an ordained a Southern Baptist minister, and is author of the book Onward, Engaging the Culture uh, Without Losing the Gospel. If you haven't read this book, I really encourage you to pick it up. I feel uh, Russell's done a wonderful job for the church in helping us to think creatively about engaging uh, this screw tape world uh, that we live in. Uh, Russell's a native of Mississippi. Uh, his wife, Maria, and Russell have five sons, so I'm a very active household, I'm sure. And uh, but one thing I have appreciated, uh, Russell uh, usually just takes one day speaking engagements so that he can get back to his family. So just, again, uh, putting first things first is something I appreciate about you, uh, Russell. I look forward to what you have to say to us today. Earlier today, he spoke to a group of pastors and really uh, had a wonderful message for them. So thank you, Russell. Thank you. Really a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's such an honor to be here at the C.S. Lewis Institute, though I wish that you had not told me that you started years ago with John Stott and J.I. Packer. Uh, I think that's what economists would call deflation to end up here now with me. I heard a commencement speaker not long ago define success as being able to face your 18-year-old past self who would not be disappointed in you and how you turned out. I, I actually don't think that's a, a very good definition of success, depending upon how mature one was at the age of 18. But what I do know is that in my own life, I find that I define success as being able to face my 15-year-old past self with gospel credibility. And that's because at the age of 15, my life was upended. I was uh, living in a Christian environment, very uh, culturally Christian. Everyone that I knew was a member of a church. But there came a point in which, uh, which I wondered whether or not Christianity was simply an appendage to Southern culture or whether Christianity was really about a political agenda or an economic agenda or about keeping people behaviorally in line. And that was especially true when I would look around and see such a, a huge division between the sorts of ideals that some of the people in my culture talked about and the sorts of things that they tolerated and lived with and practiced in their own homes and in their own communities. Uh, that was especially true when at that point in the 19, uh, late 1980s, uh, there was a, a rash of evangelical speculation about Bible prophecy with tying biblical passages to current events, supermarket scanners as the mark of the beast of Revelation 13, and, Gog and Magog as the Soviet Union till the Soviet Union fell and then became various other nations and, and groups. But what I noticed was that when these prophecies didn't come true, the people who had been selling products arguing that these were the fulfillment of those prophecies didn't go away. They didn't apologize. They just continued on with the next prophetic fulfillment in marketing things to us. And I grew really cynical and actually became uh, depressed and alarmed. And thankfully, I had read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as a small child, so I recognized the name C.S. Lewis on the spine of a book in a bookstore and was able to pull out mere Christianity and was transformed by that. Richard John Newhouse, a generation ago, talked about his conversion to Catholicism as how I became the Catholic that I was. And in many ways, I would say mere Christianity enabled me to become the Baptist that I was. And the reason for that is because this long dead by then Anglican, speaking to this confused, alarmed 15-year-old Southern Baptist, 
spoke with a kind of credibility that came with an obvious lack of regard for selling me anything. There, there was obviously in the voice of this person someone who through the written word was simply bearing witness to something that he had seen that the church had carried down for 2,000 years and it saved my life. I think there are several aspects of Lewis's ministry that are especially crucial for our day right now. I've been asked to talk about Narnian faith in a screw tape world, and I think that is exactly the sort of situation that we find ourselves in. I'd like for us to, to think about simply two aspects of that. The first is gospel imagination. Uh, the, the situation that I was in as a 15-year-old is one that Lewis well understood, talks about this and writes about this at several places. One of the places is in the screw tape letters where Lewis, speaking uh, as uh, a, a demon in this context, says this, whatever he, the Christian who's being tempted, whatever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism that he holds to or the pacifism that he holds to as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part of his religion. Then quietly and gradually nurse him on to the stage at which the religion becomes merely part of the cause in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce in favor of the British war effort or pacifism. And once you have made the world an end and faith a means, you have almost won your man. And it makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he is pursuing. Provided that meetings and pamphlets and policies and movements and causes and crusades matter more to him than prayer and sacraments and charity, he is ours. And the more religious on those terms, the more securely ours. I could show you a pretty cageful down here. This is what, in the 1920s, the Presbyterian theologian J. Gresham Machen called liberalism. Not speaking, of course, of the political categories uh, with which we often use the word, but with the idea of Christianity as a means to an end, Christianity as a tool. Lewis recognized that, and so must we. That's why I'm glad that in my own life's journey, I started with Narnia before I came to mere Christianity. I needed to find myself embedded in this story before I could really take in the arguments that Lewis was making. And as we, as we think about what Lewis was doing in the Chronicles of Narnia, it wasn't the characters there, as the other inklings knew, Narnia really wasn't as carefully a constructed myth as, say, Middle Earth was. But my experience with Narnia was similar to that of science fiction and fantasy author uh, Nicholas Gaiman, who says this. He says, the weird things about the Narnia books for me was that they mostly seemed true. These seemed to be reports from a real place. There was a, a weightiness here, and there was, in fact, a familiarity there. That was not by accident. Lewis intended this, and as he uh, put it, talking about why he was constructing this world, he talked about the, the sense of disdain that comes with an over-familiarity with the Word of God, with the great uh, doctrines of the creeds of the faith. And Lewis says, but supposing by casting all these things into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations, could one make them for the first time appear in their real potency? Could one not thus steal past the watchful dragons? I thought one could. Certainly he did. 
at least in the case of many of us in this room. What Lewis was able to do with an imaginative world is to do what the prophet Nathan did with King David, not to immediately and directly call him on the adultery with Bathsheba, but to begin by engaging the imagination, by engaging the conscience in a way that would steal past that watchful dragon of a guilty conscience. You and I are living in a culture right now that's filled with a different set of watchful dragons than at least American culture has known for some time. We're we're living in a secularizing age that causes many Christians to respond with bewilderment or with fear or with panic or with outrage. None of that should be the case. We are the people who have been given a charge to appeal to the kind of longing embedded in every human heart that that Lewis talked about when he talks about joy, talks about that sense of of nostalgia, that sense of, of longing for the future, that sense of autumn, as he puts it in one place, that sense of northernness, as he puts it in another place. That is embedded in all of the consciences and hearts of our neighbors, as is a sense of justice, a sense of a longing for a world in which there is justice. You think of, for instance, the movie Spotlight, uh, which uh, spoke about the pedophilia scandal within an institutionalized church. There is a sense in which even the most secular people can recognize that a cover-up of an evil that awful demands justice. And as a matter of fact, demands an even greater justice than what we can muster up in our context and in our laws. Lewis recognized that, and that's why Lewis spends a lot of time talking about human uniqueness, a human uniqueness that he says shows up in something as simple as ghost stories. He says, we're afraid of ghost stories. We have a sense of the uncanny and of the supernatural, and why? He says, well, you might say that we dislike corpses because we're afraid of ghosts, but, he says, I think it's equally true that we fear ghosts because we dislike corpses, for the ghost owes much of its horror to the associated, associated ideas of pallor, decay, coffin, shrouds, and worms. What Lewis is getting at is exactly what the author of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews 2, in which he talks about the slavery that comes with a fear of death. We, we see the fear of death all around us, and we see exactly what Blaise Pascal warned us of, of the running toward diversions to occupy the mind from the fear of death. We have an opportunity to speak to that sense of eternality, to that sense of human uniqueness in a way that the age actually demands. As Wendell Berry puts it, the fundamental issue right now is the difference between human beings living as creatures as opposed to human beings living as machines. When we live in a time when artificial intelligence and transhumanism speaks of moving humanity even beyond the limits of humanity itself, and at the same time often reducing humanity to simply data enlivening meat, we are the people who have the opportunity to speak to a vision of humanity that is, on the one hand, more limited, bound by creatureliness, and, on the other hand, unbound from the mere mortality of biological processes around us. We can speak by engaging the imagination, by engaging the conscience of longings and fears and warnings that are already embedded in the heart. We can speak to what Frederick Beekner talked about in his epiphany when he says that he believes in God because he was writing novels. And he recognized as he was writing novels that he had gotten to the habit of looking for plots. 
And then Buechner said, after a while, I began to suspect that my own life had a plot. And after a while more, I began to suspect, suspect that life itself has a plot. Life itself has a plot. Individual lives have plots. We have the ability to speak to an imagination with a Christian world that has been given to us in Holy Scripture in a way that is needed in this age. But secondly, it's not just gospel imagination. It's also spiritual warfare, language that becomes really uncomfortable for some Christians because they assume that spiritual warfare is what is only talked about by the Pentecostal wing of the Christian church. When in reality, we are all small p Pentecostal Christians. We are the products of Pentecost. And we are all those who are called to understand the spiritual warfare around us. N.T. Wright criticizes C.S. Lewis's two Platonic, says that he doesn't emphasize the kingdom of God, and gives him a pass on that because at the middle of the 20th century, not many people were seeing and, and recognizing the kingdom of God. I disagree with N.T. Wright on this because although Lewis doesn't speak explicitly with the language of the kingdom, he hits repeatedly on the major aspects of the kingdom of God, the summing up of all things in Christ, and the ongoing warfare against the principalities and powers that shows up in the arena of history and also shows up in the arena of each human life. He's emphasizing here exactly what Christian theologians would talk about as the already and the not yet of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. So when Lewis says enemy occupied territory, that's what this world is. He's speaking to the sense that we all must have that something has gone terribly awry. Something is wrong. He's getting at what the poet Cheswa Milos means when he says, whoever considers as normal the order of things in which the strong triumph and the weak fail and life ends with death, whoever considers that normal has accepted the devil's rule. There is a sense in which when we see the wreckage of Eden all around us, when we see the injustice and the pain all around us. There is something within us that causes us to ask, how will this all be put back together? How will this all be made right? And it gives us the opportunity to return to the stone table, gives us the opportunity to speak of a sacrificial, sin-bearing offering that ultimately defeats the injustice all around us and defeats the injustice within us. We, we speak of a combating of the forces around us, not with raw force, not with raw sovereignty, not with influence, the way the world defines influence, but with something else, with good news that is able to turn this back. And as we speak, both of the joy of the imagination fueled by the good news and of the pain and the suffering and the grief that come with living in enemy-occupied territory, our audience is not just in discipling our fellow Christians. Our audience is not just in evangelizing unbelievers around us. Our audience must also be future Christians to prepare them for the task of cross-bearing. People who might overhear us through the witness of those who've overheard us. Names and faces that we may not even recognize or know in this life. We are speaking a word that's challenging us to go further up and further in, in a way that is challenging the next generation to answer new questions in new ways from old wells, walking in old paths. 
what we have to keep in mind is the kind of Christian witness that is not fearful of reputation of the world around us. A Christian witness that is willing to be distinctive, is willing to be marginalized, is willing to be thought strange, and sometimes even to be thought dangerous. In order to speak a word to the 15-year-old boys and girls who are wondering if Christianity is really just an opiate for the peoples, if Christianity really is just a tool for the politicians, or if Christianity is a word from God. A Christianity that can address a world like that cannot rely on the culture outside to do the pre-evangelism of values for us. A Christianity like that cannot count on the culture around us doing the pre-evangelism of making church attendance and Christian identity something that is normative. A Christianity that can address a world like that must be the kind of Christianity that recognizes enemy-occupied territory, that recognizes the gradual pull of screw tape. A Christianity that also speaks to the longing of escaping from enemy-occupied territory through a wardrobe into something else and something better. That will take courage. That will take conviction. That will take a level of discipleship that is more intensive than that to which we've become accustomed a discipleship that is willing to prepare children from the ages of two and three years old, perhaps even to be martyrs as they go out into the world. But it's a Christianity that is able to speak to the heart, a Christianity that is able to speak to the mind, and a Christianity that is able to prepare Narnian Christians in a screw tape age. Thank you.